Now we will begin the council study session for today's date, May the 2nd. All of our council is present. The first item on the agenda for this meeting is reviewing the May 6th council agenda. So council, if you could please refer to that document. <clears throat> Currently, there's uh, just a few items uh, just conducting a public hearing for an annexation case that is not on the consent agenda. Uh, the first several items are liquor license and purchase contracts. Any questions on any of those items? Um, item five is various resolutions. Mr. Brady, is there yeah, something we need to talk about? I didn't want to jump ahead of council, yeah. so. Um, but Mayor, uh, uh, council, I think um, it would might be helpful. Uh, we do have a brief presentation on item 5E, so we can do that now or at the end of the, um, the agenda. Okay. Uh, doesn't hear, uh, council, is there anything you'd like to discuss before we hear the presentation from staff on agenda item 5E? Okay, thank you. Good morning, Mayor, council. Good morning. I have Kim Fallback with me this morning, and in the audience, I believe we have representatives from Mesa Golf, too, if you have any questions for them as well. Um, I wanted to just give you a little history on this lease um, out at uh, what most of you may think of as the Fiesta Golf Course. Uh, the first thing to know about Fiesta Golf Course is it's actually a stormwater retention basin dressed up as a golf course. So um, for those of you around in September 2014, you're probably more familiar with the relatively extensive uh, drainage system we have along US 60 and the basins that go with that system. The city acquired this land in January of 1975 for the purposes of a stormwater detention basin for the US 60 freeway. Um, the way the freeway, uh, the freeways build barriers for stormwater. They're kind of like dams. And 60 is no different. Um, when this was built in the late 70s, the city and ADOT entered into IGAs, and the city purchased and, and um, owns and operates the, I think it's eight basins from about Greenfield Road down to the Price Road drain. You can see the systems here. It's a pretty extensive watershed for our stormwater system and all of these basins are very critical to our stormwater system. They're critical infrastructure for us, which is why we retain control of the land. Um, this is just an overview of the site itself. The Fiesta Golf Course is actually located in more of a commercial area of the city with uh, several Hotels surrounding it, the Hilton, the Marriott, the La Quinta are all in this area. You can see we've pointed out the stormwater overflow and channel uh, to the southeast portion of the photo there. Um, there's a major channel that follows the 60 and then as the channel fills up and becomes inundated, these flow into the basins from the channel and they just provide storage. The photo on the right is the overflow as it was overflowing from the channel into the basin on September 8th, 2014. The basin did become inundated in that, in that fairly extraordinary event. The uh, lease was actually entered into, I think in 1977 as a 25-year lease and it was extended through December 2026. <coughs> The Mesa Golf came to us, I believe, earlier this year or last year and proposed some changes to the lease to get some more interest in the site. Um, they, so they proposed terms to amend the lease to extend it for 25 years through 2051 and allow additional sports and ancillary sports uses on the site install sports fields and lights paid for by the leasee. And that's shown on the, you can see it on the aerial photo on the site plan that they've provided. The leasee has the financial obligation to maintain the site, which if the city were maintaining it, we estimate to be $275,000 a year if we were maintaining it as a retention basin. If they don't maintain the site, then the lease rate goes to $27,500 a month if the property is not properly maintained so that we have the money to maintain it. The lease can't be assigned or sublet without our consent, but they can lease to individuals and groups. They've done a uh, pretty extensive public outreach in this area, this district um, within the city. They had a community meeting on August 7th at the PD station in Fiesta. And they've also had individual conversations and discussions with the Hilton, the Marriott, the Green Tea, Cre 
green tree, forgive me, and the La Quinta. So they've had some pretty extensive outreach to the area. They've got some positive feedback, and I'm sure they can share some of that with you from the, the hotels and other facilities in the area. And so what's on the action today is to approve the lease amendment uh, on May 6th for the changes to the lease agreement. Thank you, Council. Any questions on this item? Um, yes, Mr. Whitaker. I've got one question, and I'm not intimately familiar with this piece of property, but uh, I know that when we were looking at the uh, Dobson Golf Course, we put out a bunch of RFPs for different companies to manage it. Have we done the same thing in this instance, or is there just one preferred vendor, uh, company that we go with? Mayor, Councilmember Whitaker, in this case, we cannot do so until the lease would expire over five years from now. The current lease is in play until 2026. Okay, and that would be a process we would then go through once the lease expires? Well, this would be extending it another 25 years because if the leasee um, it goes out and installs major capital, like lights for ball fields, which are fairly expensive to do, then they would want a longer term lease, I'm sure, than five years. So this is a significant commitment, then the difference being that it would have expired in five years, and now you're saying... 2026, yeah. Uh, and we're not concerned at all about it, doing any competitive uh, bidding, given that we'll be extending it for such a long duration? Uh, so, Mayor and Council, um, the current lessee came to us with this proposal. For us, this is a benefit of someone maintaining our drainage space. And so they came to us and said that they wanted to um, invest significant resources to uh, bring in this, um, the soccer fields. Um, and for us, it was just, it was mutually beneficial because it's not necessarily something I guess we would, we could do an RFP for, but this is really more for us is just, it's a cost avoidance. Um, when we say it's a golf course, um, it's, not, I would, it's not the same thing as saying Dobson golf course. It's, uh, it's a retention basin. Retention it's a basin stormwater first retention before it's, basin. So they can't That's move the is. dirt. They can't, re, they can't, there's very little they can do to affect <clears throat> the capacity of the uh, drainage basin. When, so. you, when you have a stormwater retention basin, you have a calculated capacity that you have to maintain. And anybody who is on this site would be required to maintain that capacity which means it's depressed. It's much lower than all of the ground around it so that we can store the water. And it's a much different site to, to operate and maintain than you would on a, just a public golf course. So this has worked out as a very good partnership it between has. the city and the operator because um, it's avoided us having to be responsible for this basin. And they've been able to take it over and try to run um, some type of business enterprise out of it. Now they're... Um, expanding that or adding or shifting that to this soccer comp, soccer fields, uh, which we support. I think some of the questions we had um, with the neighboring areas had to do with the lighting and yes. the parking. But again, it's, um, it's, as was mentioned, it's right there where a lot of the hotels are. So we think it's, it's a mutually compatible um, use. So is a lease inflation adjusted? I mean, 25 years is an extremely long time. Well, it, in, it inflates as the cost of maintenance goes up with the site. So the, the number you're seeing here, the 275000 is what we would estimate to maintain this site ourselves. And so every year, you know, you have labor cost increases, you have uh, power cost increases, you have um, chemical cost increases that go with that. So they bear those costs. We don't. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. <clears throat> Beth, I like this idea. I like the leasee operator having the opportunity to uh, bring a new uh, uh, development there with the soccer fields. I think it, we're always needing lighted soccer fields in the community. And as long as the issues have been worked out, according to lighting, the parking, um, I'm fine with it. I think alternative uses like that uh, just um, uh, helps our park system reach out more to the community. And, and if it if the uh, leasee wants to have a private enterprise on that property and they're maintaining the lease agreement, then I'm fine with it. So thank you very much. Uh, my thoughts are similar to Mr. Freeman's. I think, the, again, if we look at this as a cost avoidance mechanism, it, it, it's a very innovative uh, and, and good idea. And I, uh, But to Mr. Whitaker's point, I, I, I'd love to look for more opportunities to do this over and over again. 
I mean, if we're avoiding $275,000 a year by shifting the maintenance responsibility to a, a, a someone Third other party. than the city, and they're providing an amenity uh, like a lighted soccer fields, which we are in short supply on, uh, that's a win-win situation. So uh, I'm, I'm all for this. Um, uh, I, I am familiar with the facility, and it, again, it's, it's very small. The golf it's course is a, is a difficult way to describe it. It's more of a Frisbee golf course, I think, is, is what I've seen, um, which is great. It's very popular. Uh, but uh, my only comment is I think I'd love to look for other opportunities, maybe some ADOT remnant pieces or, or something that we, where, where we could – we don't have the, the bonding capacity to go out and develop all these mini parks all over the city. But if we can partner with uh, the private sector to do this and shift the maintenance responsibility to them, that again is, is a, is a win-win situation. So uh, I'm supportive of going forward on this. So a quick question. Thank uh, you. Have we, uh, on the soccer fields, ensuring that the basin is protected, has that been looked at? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, I've had one of my engineers look at the basin capacity and we know what we need there. <coughs> And uh, we'll work with them as they, they're, the, the dri they're putting this on the driving range, which is relatively level. It does have some sections that drop down in it. Um, but as they grade it, we'll be working with them on that and look to, to make sure we maintain the basin capacity. That's critical to yes. us. Thank you. Mr. Freeman. Beth, one more question, sir. Um, looks like the weir gate was plugged up there. Um, yes. And it's back flowing into the retention basin. Yes. Has that been addressed? These weir gates along the uh, canal system, storm draw, uh, storm water. Some of them have been addressed. Um, we've been working with ADOT on the gates since 2014, but um, this particular one is still in place, I believe. This one, uh, we have not had um, any events in this basin as we did in other basins. Uh, it does fill up. We haven't had it uh, come out of its uh, its uh, confines. So. Well, yeah, these events are. Few and far between, hopefully. Mm -hmm. So, yes. uh, but <laughs> it was so. An, an extraordinary event. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Council. Any additional questions <laughs> on this item? Okay. Thank you, ladies. Uh, <coughs> Council, any other items on Monday's agenda that you'd like additional information on or questions? Mayor, can I just yes. quickly, just just for your information, you, you know, six D. I believe is introduction of an ordinance for the zoning uh, at the um, Grace property. So we hope it's the beginning of uh, we're working on the development agreement and uh, the other business issues that come with that. We're in those discussions, so we're hoping that in what two weeks I think it is that we'll be coming back with the uh, development agreement and the zoning. So this is uh, we're being optimistic, right, Councilman Heredia? Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, that will be a major uh, yes. accomplishment when yes. that happens. Yes. Thank you. Other questions regarding Monday's agenda? Okay, <clears throat> thank you. The next item on our agenda for this meeting then is uh, item 2A, that's to hear a presentation <coughs> and provide direction on three downtown innovation district projects. Uh, those being ASU at Mesa City Center, the studios at Mesa City Center, and Cahoots at Benedictine University. Mr. McVay, welcome. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Jeff McVeigh, uh, Manager of Downtown Transformation. Um, I'm here today to give you an update as on this project, or our progress on the ASU at Mesa City Center project, as well as to present on two new projects for Council Direction uh, on the studios at Mesa City Center, as well as Cahoots at Benedictine <laughs> University. So first, uh, to update you on the ASU project, uh, since it was approved by the lease was approved by council back in June, we have been going full force, uh, full, full force forward on um, designing this project with our design team, and in partnership with ASU, we have very recently, or by the end of day today, we'll have completed the programming design and design development, which is essentially um, we'll have the box will be designed. How? How the box looks is the next step, and that will be the schematic design, um, and that should be completed by June, June of 2019, and then we'll move on from schematic design to final design, completed in February, and move on from that point straight into construction in February 2020. Um, we are looking at a 19-month construction schedule, so that construction will be completed in October 21, 2021, and ASU would begin classes in January of 2022. 
So this is a, this is a slight change from what we have previously discussed in the schedule. Um, previously, we had intended to deliver the building in time for ASU to begin classes in fall of 2021. However, as we started working on the design and with our CMAR um, uh, um, contractor, um, we recognized that the construction schedule was going to <coughs> cause around three to three and a half million dollar premium for things like overtime and running two shifts on the site. And that money will come straight out of the project budget and take away from programming and design. So the, the, both parties, ASU and, um, and the city, <coughs> agreed that that money was better used within the better use towards construction, particularly when we understood that we could spend the additional $3 million to accelerate, accelerate the construction schedule and the, we could have one bad monsoon, and we would we were still so tight on the timeline, we could have one bad monsoon. We spent the money for accelerated schedule, and we didn't actually benefit from it anyway. So the, in the end, the, the the correct decision was to to extend the the construction schedule a few months to to be able to give us a little bit more comfort. The uh, the program is still the same, um, and since. Um, I will never be able to present this as well as Jake Pinholster does. Um, I will leave it at the fact that we are still looking at very high tech programs, digital and sensory technology, experiential design, media arts and film, um, as well as gaming and entrepreneur development. The, uh, the, the image on the bottom, uh, the programming blocks, that is, a, that is an example of what we just completed from the des design development. Um, the, uh, our architect team often calls it, the, they were playing a game of Tetris. And when you look at how the different programs within the building are divided up by space, it, it actually does kind of look like a Tetris game. Um, we are still holding very firm to the $63.5 million budget that was approved by council. Um, and I'd just like to say that the collaboration between the city staff, ASU, our design and construction team has been really excellent. Um, we have been working very hard to adhere to that budget and, and we have been doing a good job of making sure that we will not be over budget. Um, the, 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 Excuse me, Jeff, Mr. Yes. Thompson. Um, Jeff, on, or maybe Chris, uh, when I'm looking at this, I thought the ASU was gonna be paid with the excise tax bond. What, what um, city assets are we selling to also pay for this? So um, just like, a lot of uh, projects we've done, we uh, issue excise tax, for example, um, the spring training facilities. Uh, we use excise tax as the medium through which we uh, access the capital markets, but we're not paying them back with sales tax. Um, and so as we've um, stated from the beginning for this project, we would issue excise tax. That's what would be pledged to pay, pay for the bonds. That would be the medium through which we access the capital markets but the payment would come through the Economic Investment Fund. Um, for the last couple of years, we've identified funds uh, that are coming from there that are being uh, absorbed by the Enterprise Fund. But looking forward from this point uh, for the next couple of years, we anticipate there's gonna be, we, we anticipate some significant uh, sale of city assets that we believe that we can direct toward the payment of the, at least the first, uh, two or three years of debt service for the ASU building. So, for example, Mervyn's will be coming on the market soon after the completion of Light Rail uh, this month. Uh, we are in negotiations and anticipate that we will be selling through different takedowns of the union at Riverview. Um, we're also very excited. I don't want to jump ahead of myself because this will be a major announcement. We expect that by the end of June we'll have finalized the final takedown of sale at Pinal County lands, which will not only pay off all our spring training facilities, but will also um, um, accrue additional uh, dollars to the city that could go towards the ASU facility. I'm missing one. Thomas and Wrecker. Oh, Thomas and Wrecker. Also, we anticipate that there would be additional funds there um, to help pay for this. So we, um, right now, and as you look in the budget, there are no dollars identified in the Economic Investment Fund. Um, from the Enterprise Fund to pay for the ASU building. Uh, for the next two or three years, we anticipate all of that, at least for the next two to three years, maybe more, um, will come from these one-time sales of, uh, of property. Well, and I guess, you know, because I know when we bought the Mervyn's building, um, we used the funding, the funds that came off of the Pinell County um, land sale. Uh, and we were going to use those funds originally to pay down the debt service on 
the Cubs spring training facility, but we instead diverted the 1.2 million or whatever it was over to Mervin's and, and bought the Mervin <coughs> store. Uh, so my concern is that if we're tapping in to those um, city assets that are being sold off just to pay the, the debt service down on, on the ASU, you know, why aren't we using instead those funds to pay for projects that need to be done, like, um, for example, it goes back to the argument that I made when I, when I first got elected. Why, are we selling, why don't we sell the city assets and utilize those funds to build public safety facilities or libraries or other things, other assets for the city and for the citizens instead of putting them towards, um, always putting them towards debt service or, or something or buying something else. Um, when we could be utilizing those funds, for example, to build um, uh, the, the police department uh, uh, evidence storage uh, facility. They've been needing that for a long time or we could have used those funds instead to build uh, a pre, the police precinct in, in uh, Council Member Luna's district or the fire station in my district, instead of going out and bonding and asking the citizens to pay for more debt, um, use the, the, the payments off of the land transfers and so forth, utilize those funds instead to pay for that. So I, I, so, I, just, I, I think, there, I think it, there's better use for, the, for those funds um, to pay for projects than instead of going out and bonding and putting more debt service Onto uh, onto our onto our sheets, I guess. Mayor uh, Councilor Thompson, I think that's exactly what we're doing here. Uh, we're literally taking city assets, and instead of having, we're paying debt with that. I and mean, it's just, I mean, I think it's pretty remarkable that we're able to use the sale of city assets, for example, Pinal County land, and we're paying down the debt on spring training facilities. We will have our spring training facilities paid off within six years of opening those facilities. There's no, there's no city in the country that, you know, that's been able to pay these off. I mean, we've, or at least in this valley, that quickly. I mean, this is remarkable. And then with that, we see that we have additional capacity and with, uh, from those, the cell, the cell of the, um, and working with our financial advisors, we structured the debt so we could pay it off early with the sell of these assets. And in addition to the, the sell of the assets of the Pinal County land will be greater, the proceeds that we'll get will be greater than what we, it was going to cost us to pay off the spring training facilities. And so what we're proposing here, since we're already, the council's already approved us to issue debt for the, this particular facility, <coughs> is that we're going to, instead of um, having to tap into the enterprise fund to make the payments, we're going to use the sell of land in Pinal County to keep making that payment. So we are avoiding having to pay debt from ongoing operations today. So we're, we're doing exactly that. We're avoiding having to pay principal and debt by using these assets instead to do that. And with the significant amount of assets that we anticipate the value of those to be accrued to the city in the next couple of years or, or sooner, um, we think the timing works out very well that we can use that. Council's directed us to um, issue up to $63.5 million to pay for this project. So we're hoping that with the sell of the assets, we can make those payments in the first two, three years um, with these dollars coming from assets, which will save the city uh, have, from having to tap into the enterprise fund. <clears throat> Thank you. And, and just to rehearse, uh, I, it sounds like we're going to relitigate a year ago a little bit, but. Uh, when we made the decision to purchase the Mervyn's building four years ago, uh, again, the, the, just to remind people of that situation, we, we got that building at a very distressed price. Uh, it, it's a, a, in, located directly in front of a light rail station. Uh, it's a, a large building with new infrastructure, lots of real estate. Fortuitously, Valley Metro has, has been paying us yep. uh, for the Correct. use of that space ever since. So I think the, the income that we've been receiving from that building has more than covered the debt service to acquire that building. So it's pretty much been a, a status quo situation. Now we're presented with a building that has a much higher value than we paid for it, and we stand to, to reap a, a good reward on that purchase. So. Um, uh, that along with, I mean, I, I, the, the one asset that I, I think we didn't mention in that list was the Brown and Brown garage mm, yeah, <coughs> uh, yeah, from several years ago. 
So I think this is a, an example of being innovative. Uh, when we embarked on the ASU project, what we were saying to people is that we'll do this, if we can do this without raising taxes and not, without raising utility rates, we'll go forward. And we had many meetings where we discussed uh, whether or not that could be done and concluded that not only could we, that, well, that the cost of the debt service would be exceeded by the income that would be, the economic benefit that would be derived from these projects. So. Um, that's just to remind right. people of what we've talked about over the last couple right. of years. So, Mayor, in our proposed budget today <clears throat> that's before you, and for at least for the next couple of years, we do not have any funds from the Enterprise Fund going to pay for this building from the Enterprise Fund. We anticipate that it will all come from the city, the sale of city assets. Well, I have a question on that. Uh, this chart says it comes from the Economic Investment Fund. Is this, is this slide accurate? Yes. Is the, isn't the source of the economic funds the uh, enterprise, excess enterprise revenues? It, it's included, it receives, yeah, exactly. That's one source. It's a, it's a source along with other leases and revenues that are yeah, that's generated. that's not a point, but the money, I mean, it is in fact coming from the utilities if it's coming from the economic investment. The economic investment fund is the utility fund, right? Or am I misunderstanding that? Well, first of all, we don't have a utility fund. We have an enterprise fund. And the Enterprise Fund uh, receives, obviously, significant resources from the utilities, but also receives it from leases and other activities of other beyond just the utilities that are within there. Now, obviously, the utilities are a significant portion of that, but we collect leases from Banu and other um, um, operations come into that fund also. So some of the money is coming from the utility fund? Again, we don't have a utility fund. It does come from the Enterprise Fund, from yes. From the utilities? The utilities are part of the revenue, yes, that support economic investment, yes. I guess to my concern, you know, we just heard a presentation from Water last week that we need roughly $26 million a year to support our uh, water pipe infrastructure, of which we're only putting uh, $3 million towards our infrastructure. That's a net shortage of $23 million a year in investment in infrastructure. So. My concern is uh, greater than any sale of assets is uh, clean drinking water, right? I mean, one of our fundamental responsibilities, so. So, Mayor Council, <clears throat> let me just correct the record. Um, our utilities, I'll put up our utilities and the integrity of our system against any other system in this valley. For anybody to suggest that it is insolvent and that it is not producing the infrastructure is not a correct statement. It's, it's, we can uphold it against any other system in the valley. We have the, the few breaks, as few, we, have, we account for water losses. We have a good system, um, such a great system that we have major manufacturers from across the country coming to us wanting to be part to tap into our system because they know that we can deliver the water. We have sufficient water. We have great, now we've expanded our plants to be able to um, produce the water to deliver to the residents of Mesa. We wouldn't be able to expand Eastmark and Cadence and Northeast Mesa and downtown Mesa, but for the fact that we have a really good utility system. Matter of fact, it's our utility system that's one of our major economic development drivers. So to say that we are uh, shortchanging the utility and that it is in some time of emergency state is just not true. Um, and we can stand it up, and I think a presentation will be given to Mr. Whitaker to prove that point, is that that's just not an accurate statement. And what the, the point of the presentation was, we have a lot of old pipe, but guess what? It keeps working. <laughs> and so uh, we're not experiencing significant breakages. We know our system. As we're one of the few cities that has a really good idea of what's underground. And so when we have problems, we know where to go, we know how to fix it. Um, and so we're able to invest in our system. And as like most utilities do, look at them, APS, SRP, they're very much involved in economic investment in this valley. They're the major sponsors of some of the most significant events in this valley. And our utility is doing the same. Economic opportunity and economic prosperity for our community are very important to the utilities. And that's why um, they've been part of spring training. They've been part of Gateway Airport. They've been part of um, Textron uh, growing. So they're very much part of our community. Mayor, if we can bring it back to maybe ASU uh, okay. presentation. 
All right. Uh, any, any other questions regarding, let's, let's, let's do focus, the, where our agenda is on the ASU project, so Council, any additional questions before Mr. McBay proceeds? I'd like him to proceed. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Well, you know, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, the only thing I want to note on this slide is that, that I've, I've, I've put up the image that we developed when we were developing budget back in last year. Um, this is a nice image, but don't, don't fall in love with it because we fully expect it to be a completely different architectural design by the time we're done. <laughs> Uh, Mr. McVeigh, can I just, I, I think it's important that one of the, fe the feature of this that I find so uh, We are working very hard for that screen, Mayor. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the next project I want to talk Excuse about, me, the, we, Jeff, I'm sorry. Mr. Luna. Um, it would be sort of cool uh, if we could do the screen like they'd have it always at ASU Downtown Phoenix, where you go, <coughs> I think it's the College of Law. Oh, the law school? That oh, this is going to be so much better. Yes, than I, oh, yeah. I believe be much better than. If we did yeah. something like that, that would be awesome. <laughs> I think you'll be pleased once we get to schematic design. We can start showing you some some more of the the architectural design, especially as it relates to the plaza, as well. Um, the next uh, project I'd like to discuss is the studios at Mesa City Center. This is something that we first introduced as we were going through the ASU project. This is a, a project that has actually been included in our IGA with ASU. Um, we have a responsibility to, to design and construct it somewhere between 6,000 and 12,500 12 square feet within the former IT building, which was Mesa's first library. Um, in total, that's around 26,000 and a half square feet in the building. Um, and our goal is to create um, the front door to the, innovate, the downtown innovation district, the very public front door as well. Um, it will be designed to be extremely open and collaborative space, flexible, so that it can be used for multiple purposes. But this is also a place where we hope and expect to, to um, create corporate partnerships so that what happens in the ASU building can spin out, can, can grow, and entrepreneurship can happen, innovation can happen within this space, and we can grow some businesses and help with the pipeline for the downtown innovation district. Once the building is... Excuse oh, me, Jeff. Sorry, Mr. I thought you the slide. I was... Uh, I'll, one second. I'll wait till you're done. I'm sorry. Um, as part of the, the intergovernmental, agree uh, intergovernmental agreement with ASU as well, um, once this building is complete, ASU has an obligation to host um, at least 24, I'm sorry, 25 film events and 20 entrepreneur and innovation events, um, much of which would happen within this building. Um, in addition to our... IGA obligations. We are also actively working with ASU on uh, the ASU in Entrepreneurship <coughs> Innovation Group to um, work on the actual programming of the building and them helping us program the building so that it's always active. Um, and examples of the type of programming they do, um, Skysong is a, is a great example that, you, that we all know, um, where they hold workshops and events, that they hold uh, entrepreneurship training, um, place big place-based programs such as like maker spaces in Ch downtown Chandler. They have a, have a, a nice maker space. Um, and then they also do inc incubator and accelerator programs. So they also will bring in corporate partnerships um, to help uh, gain some entrepreneurship and innovation with their students. Um, it's important to note that, that this building is old, older. Um, um, it uh, does a significant <laughs> portion of this project would would be uh, improvements that we wouldn't see. So improvements to the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems, um, just to bring them up to code. Uh, there's around three to three and a half million dollars in costs just to, to get the elevators and bathrooms and the water and uh, HVAC systems up to current code. The building also has a local historic de landmark designation that the design team's gonna have to work around. Um, and we did um, select a design team recently in the last couple of months. Uh, we are working on getting their scope and budget underway, um, completed so that we can get them under con contract and design started. Um, once we have under, under contract, we imagine it'll take about six to eight months to get to the point that we'll have a, a sufficient enough design that we can come with, with solid budget numbers. But right now, we're assuming it'll be around $8 million um, to complete the project. And we are, again, um, the funding source for that would be the Economic Investment Fund. No. Mr. Whitaker. <clears throat> I just want to... Is this in addition to the ASU project, or is this a part of the ASU project? This, this would be in addition to the ASU project. This is, and the, this is a, would maintain a city-owned asset. This was wholly operated by, oh, we'd own, but we would enter into um, some type of license agreement with ASU to help manage and program the space for us. 
but it's intended to really, this is a not, this is really <coughs> intended to be a community space. Very as you can be there to assist, but we were trying to be very protective that this is a community space for the, anybody in the community. You wouldn't have to be an ASU student or affiliated <laughs> to come into the space. We want this to be our community, um, I don't want to use the word incubator, but work, um, kind of workspace, entrepreneurial workspace um, that could have a variety of different um, activities in it. This is a city facility. We, we have to, if we're not going to use it for this, we're going to have lots of other space needs. We would need to go in and do a lot of these renovations regardless. But the, the thought had been to use it as a complement to the ASU building uh, to, to kind of create a space for people to come in, a hacker space, a place for people to work on entrepreneur programs. Thank you, Mr. Luna. Jeff, uh, we had talked no about question. possibly partnering with uh, the Maricopa Community College. Is that part of, is that included in this, um, <coughs> your plan as we move ahead on this? Um, Mayor, uh, Council Member Luna, we, Maricopa Community College still has a strong interest in, in, in launching their IT institute in downtown. Um, we have actually been taking phone calls from them recently and we will be having a conversation with them again, I think next week. Um, we are going to be talking with a lot of partners um, as we go through this de design development and programming to see how um, to see how this space can work for, for multiple users. Um, the one area with Maricopa Community College that we have to work through is to determine what their vision for using the space is. Um, it's, it's possible it won't be compatible with the idea of having an open and, and collaborative public <coughs> space where they may want to have real estate versus a, a collaboration with the user. So whether, we have to work through that um, with them and see how their programming can mesh with the intended programming in the building. So Jeff, we're trying to avoid this kind of conversation where we're just having like dedicated classroom space. We want it to be very dynamic space. So it can be very fluid, it can be used for a lot of different things. We would love to have a, them to have a presence, but we want to make, or kind of we're trying to manage expectations that we're not just uh, leasing out like a room that just is <coughs> classrooms exclusively. We really see the, the benefit of these kind of facilities are where it can really be kind of um, adaptable, I guess, for a variety of purposes. Mr. Freeman and then Ms. Duff. Uh, Jeff, the, what's the building doing now? The building is it's, what? It's, it's holding, I got, it's, it's vacant. It, uh, there's, there's, some, yeah, there's, there's nothing there. <laughs> there's some remnants of, of the old IT um, data center in there, but they're, they're remnants. It's an underperforming asset. Yeah, yes. Currently. Absolutely, yeah. Yes. So <coughs> are we looking at any public-private uh, partnerships to help defray some of the costs of renovating this? I mean, I'm sure you are, but... Uh, yeah, mostly I think the, uh, the thought has been in the conversations is that we can get the private sector to come in and help with the equipment and, the, and bringing in um, expertise and having that discussion, having their presence there is what we're focused on. Well, I'd like to see some value in that in, in some of this cost differential, you know, as we go in and rehab okay. a building, you know, developing these uh, public-private partnerships and then allowing us to maybe not put as much money into the project, but I think it's essential if, as we create this uh, uh, innovation district is, you know, when I first got elected, I was able to take a tour and we saw some of these uh, at NYU and it was, it was fascinating. And they didn't have enough space to accommodate the uh, the workshops and the uh, innovation components, and there's just so ma so many dynamics to it. It's phenomenal. So I, I appreciate you looking into this, but I'd like to encourage some of the other partnerships sure. too. So thank you. You might also characterize it as a public public partnership because ASU is uh, this is one of the things they're doing for the city of Mesa is they're going to be programming, helping to program this facility and sponsoring a lot of events there that are not for their students, right. but are for the community. And to Mr. F Freeman's point is, we're trying to use that association with ASU to attract the corporate um, partners and support. So absolutely, that's, we, want, we want that to be part of this. Jen. I would like to add that this um, building is serving the community by, with ASU being here and, and having the higher, um, the higher education and um, cutting edge technologies, which brings along a lot of entrepreneurship. And what we're doing is providing a space for students and employers to, and people who have ideas to stay here, not have the brain drain that we have as a problem overall in the Valley of having 
well-educated people with great ideas leave the valley, leave the state, and go elsewhere where opportunities are. So we're creating the opportunities and creating the environment to retain those students here. So I think this is a critical space in order to do that. Otherwise, we can have all our educational um, efforts leave after they're educated and go elsewhere. This is um, the downtown area is one of the, if you look by zip codes, is in the valley, it's a considered the poverty area. And um, investing in this area is going to bring up our residents so they have more opportunities to better jobs. Otherwise, we can remain a, a depressed district or gentrify and push out the people who need to have that opportunity available right here. Um, so I'm in strong support of ASU. I think I understand your concern about bond debt, uh, Mr. Thompson, and but also, in order to pay for our bond debt, we have to look for opportunities in which we generate revenue so that we can continue to grow in you know, our newer areas. Or, so. Thank you. Mr. Luna, then Mr. Heredia. So one of the things I see as we go forward on this project is maybe partner with our Mesa Library. We've got a Think Spot located in downtown. This is a step up from ThingSpot, you know, because the whole idea of ThingSpot is to get uh, our community to be entrepreneurial, develop video programming, use media, and this would be the step up, I think, for those possibilities. So uh, maybe Heather should be involved as you have these discussions in terms of how we work collaboratively with the library and provide this kind of space, because I think it's a great idea to bring community together and, uh, and collaborate and talk about potential projects, and uh, so I'm very supportive of this idea. Thank you. You know, and I, I'm sorry, Mr. Reddy, just real quick. Uh, you know, I, I, I like this uh, uh, initiative as far as, uh, you know, I think folks might be against it. You know, it's very short-sighted to, to see uh, how, what we're doing to add value to the different pieces that uh, we're developing here in downtown. I think this, this could add tremendous value to our residents, uh, the nonprofits, the business uh, community. So. Um, Jeff, did you mention other cities uh, that have similar spaces like that? I think you mentioned Chandler. I think Avondale has some up that they invested or worked uh, uh, with. Scottsdale has Sky Song. Chandler right. has, I can't remember what Chandler's is named, but uh, Chandler, Peoria, um, a lot of cities. And yeah. a lot, uh, in, uh, in most of the cases, those are actually all partnerships with ASU because ASU is very mm -hmm. interested in, in, in doing just what Councilmember Duff said, is, is growing that entrepreneurship and innovation um, pipeline so that we are um, creating those uh, um, educated students to stay here in Arizona. OK, thank you. Please proceed. So st sticking along that same um, um, path, uh, the next project that I'd like to present to you is the Cahoots at Benedictine University. I believe this is a project that most of the council has is, is well aware of and or has been discussing, but we haven't had a chance to present it to you publicly. Um, this would be a, a partnership with Benedictine University um, to build out, uh, design and construct approximately 10,000 square feet within Gillette Hall at the Benedictine campus. Um, that would support a partnership between Cahoots and Benedictine directly. They have um, uh, recently, very recently, actually put pen to ink their deal. Um, they have signed their, their memorandum of understanding developing that program. Um, and that would lead to an entrepreneurship cur curriculum and, and degree program at Benedictine, where anywhere between 80 to 100 students per year would go through this program <coughs> that would be directly tied with curriculum and, and programming inside of the, the Cahoots. Um, Kahoot space, um, so that while the the students are getting the the academic education on entrepreneurship, they're also getting real life experience working with the Kahoots um, uh, the Kahoots operators in the space. Um, in addition to the 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 partnership with Benedictine, there would also be the the. Um, Normal cahoots space, the private, the private development, the um, tenant-based cahoots. Um, that would, um, based on our our initial discussions, would would create at least a minimum of three thousand. 300 jobs within Mesa. Um, Cahoots would, would contribute towards the project by um, completing and paying for all the furniture, fixtures, and equipment. Um, and they would also commit to regular public events somewhere around uh, an event per week. 
And, and both Cahoots and Benedictine are committing to a 10-year term. So Cahoots is committing to Benedictine for 10 years to remain in the space and to provide that, uh, that, that partnership. And Benedictine is committing to Mesa to stay for an additional 10 years. Um, we have done some very preliminary design work on this to help figure out what the, the concept and the program would look like. Um, to get to some uh, budget estimate, we're looking somewhere between 1.5 and $2 million um, for that design and construction. And again, the funding source that we're proposing is the Economic Investment Fund. Mr. Thompson. <clears throat> um, two questions. One, Frankie, can you spell short-sighted for me? Um, number two is, um, Jeff, are we working with Benedictine on um, building out class space as well? Because uh, I, with the with the visuals that you're showing around, it's a really cool concept. But is there going to be classroom space for them to continue to add their programming and, and different things? Because I know they're looking at bringing an international um, piece. I think is what uh, the last time I talked to uh, Charlie, uh, he was talking about trying to do an international studies portion. Would they be able to do that here? Is there enough space to do that here? Are they building that out uh, classroom wise as well? Um, Mayor, uh, Councilman Thompson, I'm probably going to get the number wrong, but I think there's somewhere around the neighborhood of 25, 26,000 square feet that's on built within Gillette Hall. Um, this would be about 10,000 square feet, so there's still remaining about, uh, about 15,000 square feet. Um, and going back a few years, um, when the last time the city and Benedictine um, nego negotiated their lease terms, the city actually reduced the lease term to allow Benedictine to start to build up the, the cash reserves that they would need to, to be able to do build out of the space. Um, in addition to that, Benedictine has been taking up all the free space as it uh, opens up in the Center for Higher Education. Benedictine's able to come in and backfill. So I believe um, Kevin's behind me and he can he can nod his head whether or not he agrees, but I believe that um, that the the space is there um, to be able to grow their programs and their degree programs. Um, the build out is is uh, is the question that I think has to be answered. <clears throat> Just for the record, I'm, Benedictine is very much in support of this project, and I, I think they see this as as a a huge step forward for that campus and for the university, and it, it's really going to invigorate and, and bring a lot of students to this facility. So uh, even more so than the need for class space, I think a, pro a project like this will really be the next step for Ben Yu in downtown, to my impression. Just for the record, I always thought short-sighted was two words. Turns out it's only one, so I couldn't spell it either, Kevin. <laughs> okay. Please proceed. Last slide. Okay. So, uh, Mayor, I, I am looking, we are looking for some direction um, on uh, how Council would like us to proceed on the studios and the Cahoots at Ben U project. Um, with Council's direction, we would continue to down the uh, path of getting final designs so we can get some solid budget numbers and come back to you for uh, a final decision. I'm in Mr. support. Freeman. Thank you. Mr. Luna. I think this is a great idea uh, to really create our innovation district in the downtown area and in full support of this idea moving forward. Uh, me too. Uh, but I, I would, I, I, I think it's important that throughout this discussion we be extremely transparent and that we talk in, in minute detail about the Economic Development Fund, how it, why we need it, where it came from, where it's going. I think we're asking some of us the entirely wrong question. The question is not how much does the Economic Development Fund cost, it's how much does the Economic Development Fund make for the city of Mesa. That's the relevant question. So um, Mr. Brady, I would invite us to maybe add this as an agenda item at a future council meeting in the near future, sure. where we again explore the history of this uh, Be glad to do funding that. mechanism. I'd appreciate that opportunity. And we talk about uh, why we do it. We don't do it to spend money. No. We do it to make money. Uh, and so I, I'm anxious for us to have that discussion in, in, in the open and discuss and answer in minute detail any questions or concerns or suspicions about how this is being financed. We'll do that. Thank you. Mr. Thompson. And, you know, and, and I just want to make it very clear I'm not anti-ASU. Um, there's a rumor that's been floating out there that I'm anti-ASU. Um, couldn't be farther from the truth. I think ASU can be very, they can, they can be uh, very, uh, change our, the dynamics of our downtown. I think they'd be good for our downtown as well. Um, as you know, I was against the, the way that this whole process went down. Uh, 
to begin with. But overall, I, I'm supportive of the project. Uh, I just want to make sure, you know, my, my question on bonding and so forth is I just want to make sure that we're taking care of the essential functions of the city uh, as we as we uh, move along and uh, and that our citizens are held harmless in this whole event. So. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm hearing a consensus to move forward and, and flesh out the details. Yes, of and we'll the, bring back, obviously we need to bring back, we're giving you estimates to put in a budget. We, obviously each of these projects we'll bring back to you in more detail as we move along. Um, and also as we um, have, we have success with some of the sell of these assets, um, we can, we'll kind of decide how we allocate those and where, which projects we allocate those against um, moving forward. So thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions for Mr. McVeigh? Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, the next item on our agenda, item 2B, is to hear a presentation and provide direction on three departmental budgets, those being community services, library services, and arts and culture. We're going to start with community services. Ruth, good to have you with us. Lindsay. Yes. <laughs> Good morning, Mayor and Council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with all of you today regarding our proposed budget for the next year. I am Ruth Giese, Community Services Director, and with me today um, is Lindsay Belenke from our Neighborhood Services Office, and Shannon Gross from Animal Control. She is our new supervisor. We are going to start with taking a moment to talk about some of our successful programs as it relates to your strategic priorities. One of our successful diversity initiatives this year was opening a membership for our Mesa Hispanic Network. It's an employee resource group that provides professional development and networking opportunities for all employees. This relates directly to skilled and talented workforce. Because we value a strong workforce here in Mesa, the Mesa Hispanic Network supports our own internal workforce by leveraging community and regional partnerships to help bring the best and the brightest to the city. The network has held a lunch and learn series, peer mentorship sessions, networking and volunteer events. And just recently, it launched an apprenticeship program uh, working with um, some of our field staff to develop their skills and talents. For transforming neighborhoods, our neighborhood services, volunteer, and housing programs work towards transforming neighborhoods where residents and businesses are, are engaged and um, also take pride in their own neighborhoods as well. While our programs, while all our programs are important, we will not be reviewing housing and community services our housing community development programs in this presentation today because we were recently here for you with our quarterly update for the Housing Governing Board. And then we were gonna be here with you next week on May 9th to go over all the funding recommendations and seek direction at that time. And finally, community safety. Animal control officers enforce state and city ordinances as well as provide safe capture of animals um, and the transport of animals for the safety of our public. And with regard to animal control, we're gonna be highlighting two of our performance measures today. Our calls for service includes every contact received in the office, whether it be by email, phone, or online. As seen in the first graph, our calls for service have increased over the last three years. This is due in part to our public awareness campaign um, and education efforts. Th and part of it has been through social media postings and some of the most popular City of Mesa postings have been uh, related to animal control. Increased service requests are also due to the development and promotion of our online reporting capabilities, such as email, the CityLink app, and our web form. We know that if we can make it easier for our public to send in a service request, they will do so. We can also attribute a 30% increase in this area over the last year. And uh, we are currently working with PIO to improve our citizen notification process as well. Moving to the second graph, oh, it's right there. So. Um, we, uh, Mesa does not 
own and operate its own shelter. So we do uh, utilize the Maricopa County Animal Care and Control Shelter for that service. Over the last three years, there has been a decrease in the number of animals impounded at the county. This is due to county's changing business model over the last few years. There has been a reduction of hours to drop off and the types of animals that the county uh, accepts from outside agencies. Um, as such, we are al identifying alternative sheltering options uh, to maintain that uh, high level of service. So our next map includes um, our shelter options for animal control. Excuse me, Ruth. Yes. Uh, Mr. Luna has a question. Uh, Ruth, I understand that the East um, shelter may be closing soon. Uh, what is the plan for, are you working with the county? I understand they may be building another facility. Where are we with that? Uh, so this is the okay. map. Um, actually, it's a great segue, okay. Councilmember Luna, Mayor, thank you. Uh, so um, the current um, county shelter is over up at Riverview, and that's identified um, as number one. And they are going to be moving um, to they're building a new facility um, at their campus at um, Baseline and Mesa Drive. So that's where they're going to be going. That's number seven. So there is plans there. They um, wanted to, um, you know, get a get a facility that is more updated. I think the the one at Riverview. It, it's a smaller footprint and um, other things that hadn't been updated in a while so but they're they're closing but they're going to open up another one so that's just as a follow-up you said that they're not accepting all animals they'll only accept dogs and cats is that correct no cats Tortoises. Tortoises. <laughs> <laughs> mayor councilmember luna they only <laughs> accept currently what their statute to accept which is stray dogs and bite animals so what do you do with, uh, say, a goat or something that's roaming the street or something? something Maybe else. even discuss <laughs> 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 you take it Do you take it to Vice Mayor Freeman's house? Or? <laughs> what do we do? The nearest uh, yoga place. Oh, the yoga place. Um, depending on the type of animal, we do have resources. If it is specific livestock, we are required to contact Department of Agriculture, depending on the type of livestock. Mm -hmm. Do you also work with exotic hospitals and those kind of uh, Yes, we businesses? do. Thompson. For the folks that are watching on TV, can you can you talk about or can you explain what animals um, the city of Mesa actually will uh, come out and pick up? Because I see people posting all the time of about coyotes in the neighborhoods and somebody called Mesa Animal Control, and I'm like, no. Um, can, so can you remind folks that are watching perhaps um, of what animals we do pick up and do respond to? Uh, yes. Um, we, if it's wildlife such as coyotes, um, javelina, things like that, that, those are regulated by Game and Fish, so we'll contact Game and Fish. Um, they can assist us, we'll assist them. Anything other than regulated wildlife, we pretty much deal with. And if we do have to pick something up that we're unsure of, we search for an avenue to where to take that animal safely. So if it's domesticated, more than likely it's us, and if it's not domesticated, it's somebody else. No, snakes not necessarily tree. snakes. Um, we, our officers do have reptile handling. Snakes, we relocate farther east away from residential areas. Oh, don't areas. take them farther <laughs> east. <laughs> <laughs> oh, away Sorry. from residential away. areas. Away. I'd rather have the goats. Yeah. <laughs> I like snakes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> take yeah. them farther yeah. northeast. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I do have to say, the, the expertise that our animal officers have is remarkable. They are trained in so many different areas, and not only are they trained, but they're not scared to do it either. <laughs> they, um, there's, there's video of a couple of our officers catching some rat, rattlesnakes. They are able to handle that. They are continually trained in all avenues of that. They, as the first picture in our first slide, we pick up turtles, we, uh, we go get those pot belly pigs, pigs, we, we've done lots of different things, and so they're ready to go out and assist in any in, in area that they can. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, so I did want to finish up with some of the sheltering options. So we do um, have the availability to take injured animals to First Pet. They are located at two different locations, one in Mesa, one in Chandler. 
Um, also, we have an agreement with Apache Junction. Um, so we, we support each other. They have a, a small shelter. Uh, we would be able to um, use, use their shelter in an emergency, especially if we're on the east side of town. Um, they would, so we have a great relationship with them. Uh, we uh, also have a contract with the Arizona Humane Society. They're located at two campuses, four and five out, farther out in Phoenix. And um, there's also a great partnership that we're working on with New Leaf at the East Men Valley Men's Shelter, um, located at um, number eight up there right off the 202, and it, they have um, a small vacant parcel of land at the shelter. And so we're gonna be working with them to have a temporary portable animal kennel placed on there. And we're, for animal control, we're gonna be able to go and use that for temporary shelter um, so that we can work within the hours that we have to drop off for the county. So it's a great partnership. We're really excited about it. And that we hope to have that um, by year end in December. Another of note me, is, <coughs> yes. Mr. Luna. I think that's a great idea. Um, could be potentially therapeutic, especially for the clients that are there. Uh, give them an opportunity to take care of uh, some animals. So, uh, so I know you're partnering with the new league to do that. So. Yes, okay. yes. Great idea. And we'll come back and give you more information on that as we move forward with that as well. Thank you. Um, also of note, um, there's another shelter being uh, built called Heidi's Village. It's just on the east, in East Phoenix. And they um, are building a huge facility, 40,000 square feet, $20 million facility. And we're gonna begin discussions with them to also work with them for opportunities for additional sheltering. So we're, we're trying to work every area we can. <coughs> Um, and I would like to update you on our animal cruelty investigation process. Since November of 2018, an uh, interdepartmental team was created um, to um, create a new process for animal cruelty triage and response to adhere to new federal laws. This included contracting with the Arizona Humane Society. Um, they provide care and shelter, but they also provide services related to the investigation. Uh, the team uh, provided training for the entire police department. Uh, they updated forms and policies. They posted bulletins for public awareness. And the animal control, the police department, and the prosecutor's office are working collaboratively to ensure premier response in um, these types of investigations. In five months, um, they were through um, the team and Humane, we were able to rescue 106 animals. This new process, because of its success, uh, we are seeking a one-year contract with Humane for $150,000 and to be included in the proposed budget. And now I'd like to share um, updates from our newly formed Community Engagement Division, which includes neighborhood services, diversity, and volunteer offices. The team underwent strategic planning and reorganized and updated their menu of programs to be better equipped to meet growing internal and external needs. We are focusing on working with other city departments to enhance their public outreach efforts and uh, provide best practices. We are also working internally with employees through the Mesa Hispanic Network as discussed earlier. Included in the budget is the addition of a diversity administrator position who will serve as a conduit between the community and the city on human relations issues. Uh, this uh, position will expand diversity initiatives both internally and throughout the city and ensure city compliance with federal mandates. We will be also uh, rolling out a new neighborhood leadership program to recognize and support our valued community members. This will include a hands-on training and also ongoing digital engagement support, um, such as guides and toolkits. Uh, for example, creating a template that leaders can use on their social media to reach out to their neighborhood. Excuse me, Ruth, I think you provoked a couple of questions. I know Mr. Luna has a question, but uh, 
this harkens back, I think, to our discussion of Imagine Mesa a year or two ago. I, I thought it was very effective. But uh, at the time, I think I expressed the, uh, the, the thought that rather than that being an event that had a beginning and an ending, that that be our way of business going forward where we are constantly engaging in, in uh, community engagement. Uh, that, you know, the suggestion box is always in the lobby. Uh, and so I'm, I'm wondering, I, I appreciate what you just said, where this is, you went through some strategic planning and this is uh, an initiative that we're hoping to continue. But I would just, again, maybe, and I, I even like the branding of Imagine Mesa as a, you know, kind of in perpetuity, uh, please, uh, like I say, the, the suggestion box is open. So uh, I would encourage us to even maybe more so than what's on this slide to see that as, as something that we're, the, the the community feels like we're constantly asking them for input. Yes, Mayor, I think that's great. And I think that's the role that uh, Ruth and her group play. Um, and then more specifically, if you recall, during our council strategic planning, we also talked about having a specific engagement around the topic of transportation. So we're going to be bringing that to you also. That's going to be kind of the continuation of Imagine Mesa. But to your point, uh, we also need to have kind of uh, keep open the conversation in the broadest form with our community. And I think that's what um, building the leadership and the community um, engagement with our community is really where we get the best input about what's happening in neighborhoods and what our role can be to help out. So that's, I think we'll continue that conversation. Are you imagining <coughs> though using that digital platform more so to do that? Is, your, is that what you're thinking there? Yes, and, uh, and and I do uh, agree with and appreciate the idea of maybe taking a theme at a time. For right. example, uh, transportation. Uh, I think it'd be great that we went out on a mini Imagine Mesa campaign, saying we are in anticipation of the Prop 400 reauthorization. We are looking at establishing what are our pro transportation priorities, uh, and so we make a pointed effort at uh, soliciting feedback on those issues. Mm -hmm. And then maybe a few months later, we transition to another specific okay. topic. But again, just the, the window's always open. Yeah. Uh, I know individually, we all receive a lot of feedback, but, uh, but that's more um, proactive from the community. I, I would like to see us asking uh, for more response. Mr. Luna. Uh, Ruth, I appreciate the, 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 the diversity administrator. As you know, I served on the Human Relations Advisor Board, at the inaugural board, at I, the charter board, if you will. I was appointed by Mayor Brown at that time. That was in the late 90s. Uh, and um, when we worked on the Human Relations Board working with our diversity administrator, it was quite robust. We had a lot of community engagement activities. Uh, they also served in providing a number of diversity training with city staff. Are, when you look at this, is this position going to replicate some, some of the great things that we did? Uh, during the, the early 2000s. I know it's been almost 20 years. Is that what you're seeing and will it be at the level that it'll be reporting to the city manager or what are you seeing as far as this position, the kind of programming that will be available not only for the community, uh, which is essential, but also with city staff as they work with our ongoing diverse communities. Uh, we're a big city, our, our population is changing. We have a wide variety of diversity in the city of Mesa. Mm -hmm. How do you see this happening and, and what, what is the plan for that? Council and Council Member Luna and Mayor, we are always um, evolving um, in the diversity office to respond to the growing needs, whether it be in the community mm -hmm. and internally. Um, we um, have been working directly with the city manager and we do um, check in with him routinely on what we are doing to advance uh, the diversity initiatives so that they're successful. Specifically, we have been working with human resources. We have a lot of federal mandates that are now coming to fruition with our Title VI, ADA, and other mandates. And because of that, we um, began a process where we have liaisons in every department. We um, meet with them and we get information to them to make sure that what we know in the diversity office is, is going through to all departments. That includes how we do public outreach. That includes how do we follow up with a concern that we get from a resident, uh, whether it be um, a sidewalk they can't traverse, an ADA related thing, or a feeling that they do not receive services um, equally. 
so we have that process in place. Um, that's We've been working really hard on developing that and updating our Title VI plan. We are co currently going through a full citywide transition plan where all the um, facilities in the city are being reviewed for ADA compliance. And then that's also gonna be a public, all our services that we provide to the public have to be reviewed um, as well as all, you know, it's huge. And so we've been working diligently, diligently on that. And that goes hand in hand with training our employees because part of that effort is especially our frontline staff and customer service, if you get a call and say, hey, I have an issue with whatever it is, a facility, getting into a bathroom, being able to enter a building, we need to be able to respond immediately um, and resolve that issue. And so all it is is communication. All we want is that that frontline employee knows to go to that Title VI liaison and go, hey, I'm not sure how to handle this, but I want you to know that I received this call. And that's all that the, um, our Department of Justice wants us to do because complaints can go to the highest level and then potentially could be audited, we could be audited. So we really wanna resolve all issues at the lowest level possible and that's what we're working on. So it really is a training at that level. Yes. Yes, thank you, Mr. Brady. Uh, so this position is um, will be required to be certified as a diversity professional. They go through quite a bit of extensive training with regard to um, understanding uh, federal laws, understanding how to work with the cities, um, understanding how to develop internal programs so that we best respond to the public and how to set systems in place. And so that is gonna be an important component as we go out uh, for this position once it opens up. And it's also just working hand in hand with human resources, looking at potential trainings in the future. Now trainings uh, we can do online, um, make them shorter or make them so that a person can maybe do one part of it when they have time and then another part uh, when they have others. So we're working on developing a, a new training to fit the federal mandates of our Title VI requirements. So there's a lot going on. And I have to say also that our Human Relations Board is busier than ever. Um, they are doing annual events that includes a youth peace building summit. So it's really, really important for us to connect with our youth. They're the future of our city. Uh, we also um, work with um, a women's empowerment conference. We have hosted that. Now it's, uh, well, it was our second uh, conference earlier this year. Uh, and they're busy and they are planning to uh, provide counsel um, a letter soon to give you what their uh, accomplishments were. They're just finishing their two-year strategic plan. Um, as of uh, June, they're gonna be ending it, and they're really excited about what they've accomplished, and they're gonna let it, be letting you know about that. M Mr. Brady, it might be a uh, good idea to, if it, that's possible, to have them present on one of their activities. I remember when I served on the board, uh, we presented to council at some of our activities. and. Um, just to give the community a notion that this board exists, if they have any issues. Uh, one, one last comment I have to, when I was chair of the Human Relations Advisory Board, there was a woman that uh, was wheelchair bound and she couldn't get to the meeting because we didn't have provisions for her. That was really sad, it was <coughs> great, but it was a stark reminder of ADA requirements and what we had to do. Mm -hmm. As a result of that, we quickly changed that. I forwarded a letter to uh, council member or maybe she's vice mayor Claudia Walters and said hey what's up we can't get this woman wants to come to our meeting and we don't have any provisions for her to get into the room so quickly the city responded and provided access to her so and now we have the so elevator now we have access and, yeah. to that. that was tw almost 20 years ago mm -hmm. as a result of that so I appreciate your hard work and another thing I want to say is that I know my my council assistant Isaiah uh, Garcia Romero and Marcus Steele have been very involved in the Hispanic uh, network and uh, working with field workers in terms of providing some training. So I appreciate having this Hispanic network. I think it's been a real positive move and on behalf of the city of Mesa to provide those opportunities. Thank you. So we're gonna, uh, if there are no other questions, we're gonna go to our next slide, which is our financial summary slide. 
Um, and we uh, funding for our department is over $24 million, included in the 1920 uh, budget for uh, the animal control area is the uh, contract with Humane. Um, in the diversity and outreach area, the position of the diversity administrator is included in that. Uh, a significant portion of our federal funding is in the housing and community development area. Uh, the proposed estimated budget is $22.8 million, which includes uh, the housing <coughs> choice voucher program, CDBG, home, ESG, and uh, human services. Of note, um, there is a significant variance between the revised budget and the 1920 proposed budget. What happens each year is we have a significant amount of carryover about this year, it's about six million that we move over uh, for, the, for any ongoing projects that we allocated in, in that prior year. Uh, so things like you know the downtown facade program, so that money's moving over to finish up. Um, and then also we, ha we always have reserves in our housing area that we move over each year. So that's, that's what that is. And um, before I open it up for additional questions, I want to say thank you to all of you for jo always joining our major events, such as MLK, the Unity Walk, the Pride Parade, and the overall support that you give to our department programs and staff. And I also want to recognize and thank our entire staff um, in the department for their dedication and work that they do each day here in Mesa. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, any additional questions, Council? Okay. Thank you. Appreciate the good work you do. Uh, I'm going to make a suggestion that we take a short break. It's, we've been going about an hour and a half, uh, so it's uh, eight, about 10 minutes to 9 right now. Let's uh, reconvene at 9 o'clock uh, for the next presentations. It's, uh, it's 9.01, so I'd invite everyone to take your place and uh, we'll continue the meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, Heather, our library director, good to have you with us. Looking forward to your presentation. Good morning, Mayor Giles and Council. I'm Heather Wolf, library director, and this is Tony Garvey, our management assistant, too. And uh, we are very pleased to be here today to represent the dedicated staff and volunteers of the Mesa Public Library System. We have a few highlights of this fiscal year, as well as um, we would like to talk to you a little bit about some things that we're looking forward to in the future. One of the things that we are working on this fiscal year is updating our strategic plan. This is the public debut of our brand new vision statement. And we really wanted something that made it clear that Mesa Public Library is not just about what we have for people, but it's also what we do for people and what we do with people in our spaces. We have a couple of key performance measures that we wanted to talk with you about today. Um, as you can see, there has been a slight downward trend in library visits over the last three fiscal years. But last year, we were worked very hard to stabilize. Um, and as you can see, we came very close to doing that. And this year, we hope to actually reverse the trend. Um, in fact, as of March 2019, we are up by 90,000 visits fiscal year to date. And I expect that we will end the fiscal year with over 1.1 million visits um, this fiscal year. So we will either match uh, fiscal year 2015-16 numbers, or um, at least we'll get very close. We're excited. <clears throat> Mr. Luna. Uh, Heather, when you talk about visits, are you, are you actually talking about individuals going to the library, or are you talking about access to some of the materials we have? Is that included as part of your presentation? So, um, Mayor, uh, Council Member Luna, this number is actual people through our doors. So we have um, a gate count on our security gates, and it counts people coming in the doors. Um, we do track visits to our website, uses of our databases, those sorts of, but that number is not included in this um, number. This is, so 3,500 people come through one of our four buildings every day. 
Um, when we noticed that the library visits were trending down, we thought about ways to get more people into our buildings. And so over the last couple of years, we've not only offered more programs, but we've surveyed our customers and looked at attendance numbers. So with the customer feedback and the data, we are doing better at developing programs that are relevant and useful to our community and offering those programs on days and times that are convenient. Um, so as you can see from this chart, children's programming is very popular. And so we've shifted librarians from adult services to children's programming in order to provide still more children's programming, especially for um, children ages zero to five and their caregivers. And doing this has paid off. Um, as you can see, attendance <coughs> continues to grow in this category. And I just want to say thank you to Councilmember Duff and Councilmember Luna for your recent assistance at our story times. We really appreciate you coming out and helping us um, in that endeavor. So last fiscal year, um, Mesa Public Library circulated over 2.8 million items. Um, this works out to 9,500 items checked out daily. Um, now circulation just means an item has been lent to a library user. And as we add more formats and as loan periods change, there are challenges in comparing circulation um, across our peer institutions um, and even sometimes historically within the same institution. So um, today I wanted to share with you a different performance measure. This is collection turnover. And turnover is how often each item in the collection checks out on average. So this chart shows Mesa's um, collection turnover rate compared to neighborhood, um, our neighbors in the Valley. And we get this data from the Valley Benchmark Cities report. So last fiscal year, an item in our collection checked out six times on average. Um, so as you can see from this chart, um, our collection is more active than those of our peers locally. And our collection performs well above the national average, which is 3.6. Um, since August 2013, over 11,000 children have participated in library coding programs. After the Imagine Mesa process, Code Club was rebranded as Mesa Codes, and code classes for e three age levels were developed. After a year, coding around um, participation numbers are still low compared to the other two age groups. Um, in looking at it, we've realized that we were thinking about it from a reading level, with this group being our beginning readers and our um, less confident readers. But the real issue is not their ability to read directions, it's actually their manual dexterity. So rolling dice, using a mouse or a keyboard um, can be difficult for a six-year-old, but it's not for an eight-year-old. So we are planning to discontinue the Coding Around program. Current participants will be allowed to join either the K-Code or Code Commanders wherever they're most comfortable. <coughs> and then um, in this space, we plan to offer more coding programs um, in response to parents. Parents are asking for parenting, um, parent coding classes. So they want to learn to code and um, be able to um, participate with their children. So we're going to do more um, parent coding classes as well as family um, coding and STEAM activities with the um, time that has been freed up by discontinuing coding around. Mr. Whitaker. Um, first, I want to say this is awesome that you guys are doing the coding stuff. Do uh, we have any uh, collaboration or partnerships with uh, HeatSync in regards to, you know, getting more people interested in this or somehow seeing where it can benefit? So, Mayor, Councilmember Whitaker, um, we've had HeatSync come and offer some classes for um, the adults, and we definitely want to do more. Um, we were just trying to kind of focus on this area of um, children and getting them started. But um, <coughs> like I said, parents are telling us they want to learn more and adults want to learn more. So yes, we've been trying to partner with HeatSync and we are excited when ASU comes in the hopes that maybe we can get some students to also help us um, do more programs for um, the older, um, maybe young adult and then adults. Awesome, thank you. 
Mr. Redia. Piggybacking on that question, do do we do we do the trainings or do we partner with uh, industry or other consultants or uh, who does the training pieces? And also, do we have this across the system or is it just based in downtown or? So, Mayor, uh, Councilmember Heredia. So I'll start from the second question first. So we offer coding classes at Maine, um, Dobson, and Red Mountain okay. locations, um, these three age groups. Uh, we uh, do develop our own curriculum. There isn't a lot of um, coding for um, the younger ages, ages four to six, and really we're not trying to teach them how to code. We're teaching them problem solving skills, how to take things and turn them into steps, think about things logically, so that when they move up to code commanders, they're ready to start coding because they have that thinking, that critical thinking skills, and are ready to move forward with actual coding. Um, so I'm very proud of our librarians because they've done a lot of um, looking out there on the internet um, and coming up with lessons and games to um, interact with the kids. And again, this age group, we're also trying to get the parents involved, um, you know, teaching them how to th think about, you know, things that they can do at home that, you know, coding can sound scary, but if you think of it as solving a problem, then it's not quite so scary. Um, so um, this age group, we're definitely developing our own, but we're, we're librarians, we borrow freely. Um, so whatever's <laughs> out there and it's free and available, we, um, we will use those lessons. Um, so that's how we're doing that. And then Code Commanders, um, we were using the Prenda software uh, that was developed by um, Kelly Smith, a, a local um, entrepreneur. Um, but we're finding that um, the, the kids um, we're not relating to it, so we're trying to be a little freer in what we're doing with the kids and be more responsive to what their interests are because we want to keep them excited and interested instead of having a prescribed path. Does that make sense? Sure. Thank you. So um, this slide shows some budget changes that we have for fiscal year 1920. So in the proposed budget to better serve our zero to five community, the library requested um, an increase of $62,500 for the materials budget um, to purchase more children's materials. <coughs> and uh, according to our collection analysis tool, the library is missing about 400 of the most popular best-selling juvenile titles. So some of the funds will be used um, to increase the number of titles offered to our children. In addition, um, the library is planning a new service that we're calling the Always Available Collection. Uh, this will be a stock of up to 30 copies of select children's picture and chapter books, and they would always be available at both the Main and Red Mountain locations. Uh, this is a staff-initiated project. We noticed um, children are all about instant gratification, so if a popular book is on hold, or it's checked out and there's none available. They don't want to put it on hold. They don't want to wait a couple of weeks to receive that item. So we're trying to make sure we have enough copies that they can walk into a uh, location and be able to check it out, see it on the shelf and check it out and take it home. So last year we did experiment with a pilot collection to see um, if there really was this need. And we developed a core list of 70 classic and award-winning books and we purchased up to 30 copies of each of these. And um, items in that core collection had a turnover rate of 12.6. So that meant that those items were out in the hands of children 38 weeks out of the year. And as um, you saw from the earlier slide, that turnover rate is double the turnover rate of all of the materials. So we thought that that was really a positive indication that if we can make sure those books are there available, the kids will check it out and take it home instead of walking away with nothing. So um, we will be expanding the 70 titles to actually 110. Uh, Maine and Red Mountain will receive 110 titles. 
we will keep uh, the 70 core titles at the Dobson location, so Dobson will also have an always available collection, just a slightly leaner collection because of space considerations at Dobson. Um, in addition, the library will need a one-time investment of $25,000 for display shelving for this new collection. And uh, finally, this uh, last picture here, I want to thank the police department. They've been paying for the main library's uh, security officers for a number of years and the navigator this last year. They have uh, transferred the funds to the library going forward and from now on we will pay for those services directly. And I'm very pleased because we also will be able to have a security presence at the Red Mountain location during our operating hours. And we feel a visible and consistent security presence during those operating hours will result in our um, customers feeling safer. And um, when incidents do occur, it will be um, very beneficial for staff to be able to concentrate on providing library services and will allow the experts to deal with um, the security incident. Mr. Freeman. Thank you. That prompted, I wrote a uh, question in the back of this presentation, but how do the patrons feel? Do you get feedback from your patrons when they, about the security and safety of the library? So, um, Mayor, Vice Mayor Freeman, um, we do get feedback from um, some of our patrons that, um, and we've been trying to address things as they arise. So um, we've increased the number of security officers um, at the main library. So we have two certain hours of the day. So the idea being if one's on the first floor, one's on the second floor. If one's outside, we have one inside the building. Uh, again, just by being more visible, it helps everybody feel safer and more welcome. Um, they can address uh, what we call our code of conduct. They can address code of conduct violations um, as they see them, as opposed and be very proactive, as opposed to waiting for somebody to come up to a staff member and report um, that something's going on that they, makes them feel uncomfortable. Well, and so. Heather, it, it also to the point is it avoids having to have the library staff come enforce <coughs> some of these codes of conduct, which is sometimes um, not in their nature. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to say it. Um, and and it's, it's difficult. And yet, and so the security kind of take on that role. I think it, it helps also. It's, it, it's protecting the staff, too, along yeah, the way. Exactly. So. Yeah, exactly. So we've been working with um, Detective Aaron Rain um, a lot um, on our code of conduct. Um, for example, um, I'll tell a story on me. So he took a picture of a gentleman checking out a library book, and he had a bat sticking out of his, um, his backpack. I looked at it and was like, great, he's checking out a library book. And Detective Rain had to point out to me, well, that's a weapon. And people might feel unsafe seeing somebody walking around with a bat sticking out of their backpack. And I was like, oh. So um, to uh, City Manager Brady's point, um, sometimes we come at things from the library point of view, and it really helps to be working with the security officers with PD to make sure that we're also looking at things from a safety point of view. <clears throat> well, and to that point, too, I, 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 we want to have a welcoming, uh, non-threatening uh, um, environment, obviously, something that, that where you feel comfortable bringing young children. To that end, part of the bond package this last election was making some physical improvements in addition to new library out at uh, Eastmark. Can you um, tell us when, when we expect to see <laughs> so, those improvements? Mayor, I have a few slides. Um, okay. In, I'll, I'll be patient. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you're excited because I do have a slide about that. <laughs> Thank um, you. So uh, before we get to that, though, um, budget changes for fiscal year 1920 continued. Um, with the bond approval, the library will see a one-time increase to our budget to equip and furnish the new spaces at the Dobson and <clears throat> main library um, locations. Once ThinkSpot at Dobson is open, there will be a librarian to provide programs and training in the space. We will also have uh, 2.5 library assistants to staff the service desk and assist with equipment use all 54 hours the library is open. So 
Um, All right. Yep. And then. Oh, okay. So um, this letter is um, something that we received along with several um, beautiful books. So it says, just a quick note to let you know how much your library means to me. I grew up in Mesa and spent many hours reading the cookbooks at the library for inspiration. I would like you to consider including these books as well so that possibly someone else can enjoy it and become a chef as well. And it is um, signed by the chef owner of Elote Cafe in Sedona, Arizona. So um, it's, it was wonderful to realize that we were the inspiration for um, a chef and restaurant owner um, all those years ago and he still thinks so fondly of the library. The Corn Cafe. Huh? I just want to mention that I have his cookbook at home. Oh. <laughs> well, and if you don't have his cookbook at home, we now have uh, a, a copy for someone to check out. <laughs> so, okay, so this slide shows the library's budget for the um, previous fiscal year, the current fiscal year, and the proposed budget for next fiscal year. Uh, for the current fiscal year, I'd like to point out that every year the library plans to save 2% or about $150,000 in order to meet the budget office expectations. But this fiscal year, we had a significant number of vacancies. Um, in fact, um, at one point we had 10% of our positions vacant. And this created uh, a significant um, additional um, savings in vacancies of over $400,000. So this is why our year-end estimate shows us underexpending so much. Um, and then as you can see for fiscal year 1920, our proposed budget um, has grown slightly compared to the fiscal year 1819, <coughs> and that's due to the changes that I outlined on the previous two slides. Um, so this map shows our current locations as well as the voter approved um, library in Southeast. And I would just like to update you on the Mesa Express Library. Um, due to significant changes at the mall where we are located, we are working with real estate to relocate. Um, that location is no longer working well for our customers. And so um, we are looking to move out of there before the end of the <coughs> calendar year. Um, and then we are very excited about um, the uh, voter approved library, but it also um, reminds us that we need to keep our eyes open, looking forward to the future um, for other opportunities to provide um, library services in our underserved areas of the city. Okay, so I think this is the slide that the mayor was um, looking forward to. So, um, just recap a little bit where we are with the various voter approved um, <coughs> library projects. So currently we are working with the architect to design the improvements for the Dobson location. In addition to um, some space for ThinkSpot, we also are hoping to improve the facade to match the new park and also to make the library entrance, entrance more visible and welcoming. At the main library, we are working with the same architect um, to design an expanded and updated children's area. So our goal is to make the first floor as family friendly as possible. And we will be moving um, the adult services um, up to the second floor so that we will have a greater separation between services for children and families and um, services for our adult um, library users. Um, as for the new library, we want to make sure we include elements that the community has already told us they want. Um, in the community conversations we had, they want a destination library, they want it to be um, community centered, they are looking for it to be a technology hub, um, they would like separate children's and teen spaces, they are looking for um, plenty of space for popular materials, they would like collaborative space for small um, and large groups to meet, and they also would like an event space for the community, food and beverage, and um, 
light and bright connected to the outside environment. Um, so we will be excited to see what we can cram into 30,000 square feet. I'm optimistic. The staff are really looking forward to um, taking advantage of some new technology that is um, coming out um, to um, incorporate more self-service opportunities. So um, we think this new library will give us a chance to do some really creative um, things with self-service. Thank you, Heather. Uh, questions, Council? Mr. Thompson. Yeah, and, and Chris and I, we've talked about this quite often. As, as we get squeezed out of Power Square Mall, um, you know, the need to find some, <coughs> some real estate around there yeah. somewhere, you know, a pre, <laughs> something hopefully that's already standing, uh, that's in good condition yeah. or uh, that's close, close by or near the existing. And we've right. talked about several locations. And so we have a, a short list that maybe we could just share with you offline okay. since we're kind of in negotiations and looking, but look, we, we can, Heather can get with you okay. and share. We, we are narrowing that down to a few. Yes, we're getting ready to set up two visits um, shortly. So there, there's, there's a, you know, I was, I was impressed with the number of people that go there. My wife uses the library there all the time. So, so it's very popular with the community around us. And so I just want to make sure that as that one transitions into, into uh, non-existence that we quickly stand one up um, to continue to provide for the community. Appreciate that, Councilmember Thompson. Thank you very much, Heather. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, arts and culture, Cindy Ornstein. Welcome, Cindy. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor, Council Members, and City Manager. My name is Cindy Ornstein, and I am Director of Mesa's Department of Arts and Culture. Happy to be here presenting to you this morning, and happy to represent the entire Arts and Culture Department, including the very hardworking staffs of the Mesa Arts Center, the Idea Museum, and the Arizona Museum of Natural History. To start out with, um, we, we're sharing our department mission and rather than, oh wait, we're not on the whole. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Candace. Um, that looks better. We, we're, we're, um, we're a very big department in terms of the number of programs and services we provide. It's, it's a kind of an enormous smorgasbord and in the few minutes we have this morning, what you're going to get are a couple of tiny little snacks, but we hope we'll be able to give a sense of the breadth and depth of what we're bringing to the community. Um, our department mission seeks to, uh, I'm not gonna read it, but to say that it's really, uh, it really echoes a lot of what we've been hearing and talking about this morning in terms of reaching out in a very broad and diverse way to our community with things that are relevant and transformational and reach across sectors. And in that regard, the arts and culture programs really seek to uh, support the council's strategic priorities and especially the notion of the importance of innovation, delivering innovative services and solutions, which I'm quoting from your priorities. Uh, arts and culture programs employ innovation to address all of these priorities and to encourage our community to dream, uh, discover, and develop themselves. In essence, our, what our programs do is seek to build a, a safer, healthier, and more vibrant city with successful people and supporting a strong economy. So we feel that we deliver services across all of these priorities, and I'm not going to read the slides, but I'm going to point out a few ways in which we do that. Um, there's a long list for each of the priorities, and each of these programs in, and many more deserve you know, uh, a chance to dive in and go into their, their contents. And we, we're, we're not gonna be able to do that this morning, so I'll touch on a few. Um, in building our community safety, we really feel that the, the support of the safe, healthy, and welcoming environment that this speaks to 
um, is really exemplified in our thriving arts and service program that brings free studio programs to veterans and military members at Mesa Arts Center. For transforming neighborhoods, uh, we really take to heart the idea of engaging our neighborhoods with experiences, and we do that in many ways listed here, um, including the idea that we go into the neighborhoods. This year we did two in-depth artist residencies in the communities, the, the very low-income communities south of downtown, and um, we're continuing that work in those neighborhoods in the coming year with our next version of our prototyping festival, um, which you'll hear more about later. For placemaking, which is a big part of what we do, um, where we seek to create um, unique spaces and infuse learning and creative experiences into um, many areas of our community. We are uh, really proud of what we're doing in the area of community events at all our venues to open up our doors and create opportunities for people to enjoy the many programs and resources we provide. For skilled and talented workforce, um, we are uh, helping to develop skills for success. And I think especially if you look at this list, um, that's particularly notable for youth. Uh, we work very, very hard to provide a lot of different kinds of experiences that help youth develop their own uh, direction, their own voice, their ability to express themselves and be creative. And for the sustainable economy, we're bringing people from across the valley to spend money here. Um, and, and it's making a big difference. You may recall that in 2015, in the Arts and Economic Prosperity Study, there was $29 million in economic impact from the arts in the city of Mesa, not just from us, but from all arts and culture in the city of Mesa. And obviously, we're now four years on. That number would be in the 30s now. And when we next do Arts and uh, Prosperity in a couple of years, I'm sure we'll see that uh, continued growth of the impact. The department continues to build Mesa's brand. Uh, arts and culture helps build our reputation as a place of creativity and innovation in all kinds of ways. We list some of them here. I'll just highlight a couple of them, uh, uh, and we'll do that as we move through to, to not, uh, not belabor the many lists of programs. But uh, one thing we're really proud of is that we've been able to double our support for our arts and service, the program for veterans and, and uh, military members, service members. Uh, this coming year, we will enjoy $126,000 total in support between generous grant from Boeing and also one from the Arizona Department of Veterans Services, which will expand that program to both the fall and the spring. And uh, it's been incredibly well received and is fully enrolled. And, and in fact, there's a reception coming up celebrating the, uh, the work that the veterans and, and military members in the program have done. So we will make sure that you get an invitation to join us and see what it's meaning for them. Uh, people walk up and thank us for that program, and we're very proud of it. I also wanted to say that we um, uh, at Mesa Art Center have uh, had a very successful year of raising additional funds for Project Lit, which is the umbrella program for K through 12 students. And we exceeded um, by several thousand dollars a $40,000 challenge grant from um, Bill Passy, Maria Silva, and the Nesbitt and Elliott families, uh, which have really allowed us to expand and uh, not only broaden but deepen the work with the young people in, in our community and throughout the valley. Um, we, these, this was really helpful in combination with a major three-year grant from Pulliam Trust in support of that work. So we are devoted to continuing to build the number of schools we're serving and the number of students who get touched by and are empowered by Project Lit.
for at, at Arizona Museum of Natural History, um, uh, we have so much going on. You can see we've had enormous growth this year. They are actually, uh, their participation, and you'll see it on a chart later, is 19% year to date over the prior year, which is amazing. Um, credited in part to the attention they're getting because of the wonderful dinosaur facade we added that creates a lot of awareness of what's inside the building. But inside that building, they've also added their new exhibit, Na Native Cultures of Western North America, which is very beautiful. And they continue to upgrade their galleries and make it have new experiences for the visitor. At Idea Museum, there's been wonderful forward progress this year in many ways. Um, it's particularly notable that they um, continue the work from a very large uh, uh, support in the Agile program from the Piper Charitable Trust. And that has also allowed a museum <coughs> renovation, re rejuvenation project that has in small ways started to rejuvenate the galleries because we know there's a lead time uh, with a capital campaign and the timeline before we'll be able to expand the museum through the bond that was uh, approved by the voters. And this is allowing additional enhancement as we move toward that date. And finally, in, uh, we've strengthened our relationships with all of our nonprofit support organizations, including uh, updating the agreements uh, that we have with each one. They're in final review with the city attorney now. And uh, we feel that it sets the, sa the stage for continued growth of their support of our, of our work. We're highlighting just a few top performance measures this morning. Uh, these are ones that are, are very accessible. Uh, we are working hard for next year on starting to work a little uh, more deeply in looking at some of the other areas of impact. And with the new performance measurement system, we're really excited about how that will help us tell you our story and tell, tell others our story. But we'll, today, we'll point out how we've progressed in participation uh, for the three venues and the combined work we do, customer satisfaction with the quality of our programs, and customer satisfaction with the service we provide. Participation this year was really, um, really good. We're excited to say that, that we're fairly confident at this point in our year-end projection that it will be a record number for the department. Uh, you can see the projection for 1819 in the in the, the shaded line at the far end of the of the graph. What's important about this trend line is it shows many years, and it shows that we are there's a really good solid trend line of growth, um, which is going to continue to be challenging because we are serving a lot of people. Our 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 buildings are busy almost all the time. Uh, we are, our staff is, is stretched in a good way uh, to serve that many people. But we're very, very pleased that we're continuing to push that uh, goal and, and, and see increases. We're just shy, we're projecting being just shy of serving 700,000 visits for the year. And maybe we'll even make that because we're, we continue to be very busy and hope, hope that'll last through the end of the fiscal year. Our customer satisfaction this year, we're so thrilled that we saw an increase. I, I really uh, thought that we were reaching for the hope of having an increase because we had really good numbers to report last year. We were able to increase the number of respondents. You can see we had almost 6,000 survey respondents this year to the variety of programs at the three venues. And uh, this shows the ratings for the top three and then the top two ratings. Our goal is to meet or exceed 85% that rate us uh, the program quality as excellent or very good, and the customer service as uh, uh, having extreme satisfaction or very, very uh, satisfied with that service. And in, in fact, we reached 91.8% and 91.1% uh, of satisfaction. When you add in the third category, which is still positive, it's, it's good or satisfied, uh, those numbers skyrocket to close to 100%, as you can see. We do have a few significant changes to share for the coming year. We will be um, 
greatly enhancing our data collection efforts this year through uh, primarily through through funding from uh, foundation support, <coughs> and that includes new data on market awareness, penetration, and perception for all of us. And also uh, at Mesa Art Center, we're going to be looking, taking some deep dives into the meaningful impact we make on on the people we serve. And uh, we're very excited about being part of a national tool called Intrinsic Impact. I haven't been turning my pages. Sorry. Just to make sure that I highlight the key things. So since this is about significant changes, just to note that we are really all working very hard to raise contributed dollars to enable us to expand our programs and services. It's going well. We've seen good increases in uh, contributed revenue. And that those efforts are con continuing in a very aggressive manner. Um, we've had some, at MAC, we've had some good uh, opportunity to restructure staffing to serve the community better. Uh, we had a combined special events and volunteer position. We were able to split into two, and those are both very important because obviously we greatly expand our impact with volunteers over what we can afford to do just with paid staff. And so we're, we're excited to continue to grow our volunteer program and to expand the special events that help act, act, activate downtown and various areas of the community in which we uh, do events. Uh, Idea Museum obviously is preparing for a capital campaign. That's gonna be a big effort, a multi-year effort. Um, and the city is increasing its support to Idea Museum by $50,000 this year to enable the foundation, uh, this is to increase their investments. This is $50,000 in dollars that will support staffing costs that were covered by the foundation, allowing them then to reinvest in some other areas. And uh, Natural History Museum is, um, working already on, on both renovating and expanding permanent galleries, and they're also planning for the future to do more of that. Finally, just to touch on the fact that we have um, several major community engagement projects on top of all our smaller, many smaller ones that happen throughout every year. Uh, we have a major community collaborative around water working with several other city departments and with funding from the Arizona Community Foundation. And um, another funder that I can't announce yet publicly, but that we just got word we are getting an additional 50,000. So that will give us the f basically the full funding for that project. Um, that'll be <coughs> announced in a couple of weeks publicly. We uh, are expanding the and continuing the Mesa prototyping project supported by the National Endowment for the, the Arts. This speaks to the idea of Imagine Mesa again because it en enables the community to think about what they want and experiment with it with actual concrete objects to see what it might look like for activating, connecting, enlivening, uh, making someplace feel more safe. Um, and that will happen on the south side of uh, downtown <coughs> in, the, in the winter next year. And then we have a major project uh, with a nationally acclaimed Native American artist who will work with regional artists on a project around indigenous art at Mesa Community uh, Arts, uh, Mesa Contemporary Arts Museum, working with uh, many, many uh, different uh, communities here. <coughs> Finally, a recap of our department expenses. You can see that we do have growth in the coming year. Uh, the year-end estimate, we, we do usually come in under our expenses. We will end up, this was the second quarter, the second quarter estimate. The estimate for year-end is more like 16.2 or 16.3 million, but still a fair amount under on the expense side. The proposed budget does include the normal increases of medical and, and uh, workman's comp and things like that, and also a pool of money that we have that is an expense capacity to enable us to spend grants when we get them, but we don't use that expense capacity unless grants or donations to fund them are realized. So with our aggressive 
activity in, in development, we have been getting a lot of new grants and sponsors, and that will enable us to spend that money when it comes in the door. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. <clears throat> thank you, Cindy. Council, questions? I, I have one. Mr. Freeman. Cindy, thank you. You know, every time I attend an event there, I really enjoy it. I was just wondering how art, uh, art space, the loft units, have integrated into the Mesa Art Center, and are you leveraging that? I know it's kind of brand new. Uh, are artists coming over and participating at all? Mayor and Council Member Freeman, um, I really appreciate that question. We are working with art space in many different ways. Um, most, the, probably the most, the largest and most visible way this year was that one of our two community artist residencies on the south side was actually a, look, it was a collaboration of Mesa Urban Garden and, and Art Space Lofts. And two artists from Art Space led a community artist residency for that entire neighborhood. And then when the at the culmination of those residencies, we had the community celebration event for, where all the neighbors in those neighborhoods were invited. Uh, we did that at Art Space just a few weeks ago, and it was a wonderful event. We also just recently had the artists come over for an in-depth tour of our studios to get to know our studio instructors, both to realize what might be there for them personally, as well as what opportunities might be there for them to be instructors at uh, the art center. So, uh, and we're working individually with a number of the different artists on other projects. So we, we're very excited about them being there and we look forward to co continuing the partnerships. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you. Other questions, council? I don't have a, um, a, uh, excuse me, a, um, question, but I just had a comment. On Sunday, I attended the um, Jazz Festival at the Art Center, it is, and it was proclaimed as International Jazz Day. But I was just amazed. I've attended most of them over the years, and the attendance is just continuing to grow, and the reach, and what it does for our community in providing that social equality and equity, and in growing that as a community has been tremendous. I think the Art Center, and I th the, thank the voters and all the efforts at um, the Mesa Art Center and the Arts and Culture Department for the um, how it, what is meant to not only our downtown area but in Mesa in general. I think it's been a catalyst for a lot of opportunities, and um, I'm just so proud. I know when talking to other cities as I go to various um, meetings and stuff like that. It is our identity. Oh, Mesa, you had that wonderful art center. I've been there. And one of the things I love about it is that we have the coordinated effort, not only in the art center, but of our museums and supporting an art space to do coordinated projects and coordinated community outreach to bring up our neighborhoods to do these projects. So I just see it growing and growing. And I want to thank you and all your staff um, for the efforts as well as the support. Um, from our community. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Jen. Uh, Mr. Luna. Uh, also, I just think that uh, Cindy and her staff has worked really well with our community. Uh, if you go during the Dia de los Muertos celebration, you're going to see thousands of people there. And uh, Cindy and her staff have really put a lot of effort into even making it bigger and bigger. So thank you for that. I think it's real important, especially for the, the Latino community, it's something that they can go to, get acquainted with the Arts Center, and continue to promote that wonderful, um, wonderful venue that we have in downtown Mesa. We're very, very fortunate. It's one of uh, an award-winning venue, and uh, having these kind of collaborative uh, efforts is very, very important for our community. So thank you so much for what you do. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'll just uh, chime in and say amen to, to those comments. When when I go to the to the MAC or to the Arizona or the Arizona uh, Museum of Natural History or the Idea Museum, they're always packed. Uh, and, and that is a beautiful site. So the, these are facilities that are being used and appreciated by our community members, but also a, a great attraction to our community from, from outside the community. So very successful program. Appreciate all that you're doing. And uh, again, it is a, very much a point of pride for our community. Mayor and Council, thank you for those comments and thank you for your support of the work we do. We, we could do it without your support and it's very meaningful that you see the way we try to serve all the community and engage them in the ownership of these facilities. They, these are their facilities. We're very, very well aware of that, and we want to make it palpable to them every day.
Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> so, Mayor, this is the Mayor and Council. This is the um, scheduled final pre departmental presentation. Uh, next Thursday, we'll just go through a summary again of kind of what's in the tentative budget, just so you're familiar with it. And then I think it's the following week, 16th, then we'll be asking for your, we'll, we'll go through all the di different steps of adopting the budget, but we ultimately do a tentative budget and then that leads to a final budget at the end. So we'll kind of do a little bit of a wrap up next week just to kind of remind you of what's in the proposed budget, um, if any adjustments we've made during this time and just kind of review that with you next week. But we don't have scheduled uh, any additional presentations at this time. So thank you. Council, does that sound okay to you? Any additional information you'd like to hear from city staff before we proceed? Mr. Thompson. Chris, could we get uh, maybe a breakdown also of, of the different um, outside agencies or organizations that we find like GPEC, um, Visit Mesa, um, Phoenix East Valley Partnership, uh, just kind of get a breakdown and, and a list of how much we're funding. Because I know like GPEC, uh, their funding is going up uh, and perhaps a couple of others are as well. And just as a council, I think we need to look at that and, and make sure that we're okay, um, you know, pushing the additional funding in there um, to those organizations. Oh, yeah. Visit Mesa, was there another one? The Phoenix East Valley Partnership. Oh, right, sorry. Uh, and any others that, that, that I'm not thinking of. Okay, I'll um, just, okay. just, because I know the last time we had a really, had a really good presentation on that it was probably about four, maybe five years ago. Um, and it's something that we don't really look at all the time. And I think sure. it's, it'd be good to revisit all that and make okay. sure that we're comfortable with it going forward. Okay, we can do that. Great, <clears throat> other questions? All right, thank you. The next item on our agenda is item three. That's to acknowledge receipt of minutes of boards and committees. Is there a motion to that effect? Thank you, Mr. Loon and Mr. Thompson. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Item four is to hear reports on meetings and conferences attended. Council, anything you'd like to share with us? Yes, Jen. Well, of course, I have a long list as usual. But I think, uh, Mr. Luna, you'd probably like to share about the Hispanic leadership graduation? Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, yes, we honored actually Marisa Ram Ramirez Ramos. Uh, she was awarded uh, the Hispanic Leadership Award. I won't, I won't say the what award the name. It's the Dave Luna Award. So, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so we certainly want to honor her. And uh, it was a, a wonderful event, a well-attended event. And the whole idea is to uh, certainly cultivate Latino leadership within <laughs> Uh, the East Valley, and particular the, the Latino community here in the city of Mesa. So, so that was a lot of fun, and uh, I did a lot of reading, did a lot of stuff at Boeing, uh, working with Boeing, and uh, looking at student projects. You and I attended a project. We also attended the JAG event, and uh, and then I'll, whoever wants to speak about it, last night, that would be a great thing to talk about over at the police department. Well, I'm. <clears throat> Uh, all of us, literally all, all seven of us were at the event uh, yesterday afternoon at the Mesa Police Department. It was a, a very meaningful event. We unveiled the, the statue uh, that is now in front of the uh, downtown headquarters uh, honoring our three fallen police officers. Uh, I thought it was a very poignant, very, uh, it was a great event to remind us of uh, our, how important our public safety personnel are to this community. So I appreciate the fact that all of our council was here and, and I think uh, the public safety departments appreciated that as well. I'd like to also bring up a few things. Um, last week, we celebrated Arbor Day with Holmes Elementary School, and we planted a pine tree at the park across the street from the school and talked about the importance of trees. And I'm sure the kids will enjoy throughout their lifetime to be able to go back and see that tree and uh, go. And um, so that was uh, really nice. Um, also attended the Mesa Public Schools Young at Art event on last Friday. The art from our students and the schools right here in um, at the old Irving School, the historic school, tremendous. I'm, I'm, I'm just amazed and I'm glad to see that art is still alive in our public schools and they're and, um, amazed with their uh, talents. Um, Zen Nights in downtown Mesa um, last Friday. We celebrated um, Earth Day, but it was also their second anniversary of the vegan uh, um, festival. And uh, so it's the last Friday of every month. 
and uh, to be more friendly to our earth and the way that uh, um, and, and be kind to animals. Um, and MCC uh, uh, had a um, graduate, a senior high school, a senior graduation for the students enrolled in the um, ACE program, the Achieve College Education and Hoops of Learning program. And these kids are, um, they're young men and women, are students that wouldn't necessarily have the opportunity or even think about going to college. And through these programs, they have, uh, teach the skills, find those, find the funding. These kids are balancing going to high school, um, college, usually working a job, and sometimes caring for um, their family. And they're amazing at their commitment to make sure they have a college education. And um, I was very impressed with the event. So with that, I'll be quiet now. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anything else you'd like to share with this council? All right, uh, Mr. Brady, what does our uh, schedule of future meetings look like? Thank you, Mayor. Just a reminder, we have a um, study session and council meeting on Monday, May 6th. Um, but before that, uh, this weekend, May 4th, Councilmember, why don't you uh, sure, yeah. announce that for us? So at World Junior High, we will have our, our second uh, spring blast. Uh, thanks for all the departments that are going. Uh, firefighters cooking hot dogs and hamburgers. We have the Pulse uh, radio station from EVIT uh, going. <clears throat> so a lot of collaboration opening this, the pools. Uh, it's gonna be uh, toasty, uh, I would, uh, <coughs> per the weather. So we will have the flow rider uh, for folks to ride. Uh, so looking forward to, uh, uh, you know, uh, attending the, the, the event and maybe make sure that everybody come out uh, from 11 to 2 p.m. Uh, this Saturday, so. Thank you, Councilmember. And then um, we'll talk about the barbecue next week, or do you want to start teasing it now? You know, that, I, I think we should start teasing it now. Okay, go for <laughs> it. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm going to host a uh, barbecue at the Mesa Historical Museum in Lehigh and help uh, jumpstart their renewal process and uh, community engagement. So I'm excited about that. Uh, it needs a, a jumpstart. Uh, Mr. Natker is doing a fabulous job there as the executive director. So come on out, and it's going to be catered <coughs> by the rendezvous here, and it'll be great food. So this coming, well, next Thursday, May 9th, a week from today, yeah. from uh, 6 to 8. Okay, put it on your calendar. Thank you. We'll be there. Mr. Luna. Uh, this Friday evening is uh, La Senda's Food Trick Friday, so if you're at La Senda's and want to eat some great food, uh, please come by, and then on Saturday morning, uh, beginning at 7 a.m., we have cops and bobbers, and I will be there with our public safety personnel as well. Great. <clears throat> Anything else we'd like to talk about? If not, is there a, mo a motion to adjourn this meeting? Oh, thank you, Mr. Luna. All in favor, please say aye. 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 We are adjourned. <laughs>